extraterrestrial intelligence. Chapter 11 Oak Grove Drive passes La Canana High School and the emerald lawns of Oak Grove Park till it curves gracefully toward the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Sam slowed his vehicle as he approached the main gate more than a mile away. It was a reflex action. He turned off all of his radios. He slowed even more as he saw the top floor of several of the 132 buildings on the JPL property. The warm, familiar feeling came over him again, the same feeling he had many times before when his father took him to work at JPL. It was as if he were approaching some great monument, Valhalla, a place of reverence and respect. Something great was happening in those buildings, Wondrous, glorious experiments were being manned and monitored by the people who truly loved their work. More than just a corporate sense of loyalty, these people had almost a nationalistic sense of loyalty to JPL. Sam was coming back to those 176 acres, and it was as if he belonged. It had been several years since his last visit, but the memories were fresh and crisp. He could barely see the nearby San Gabriel Mountains through the schmays, the combination of smog and haze. To his left, the parking lot was full as JPL engineers and employees scurried to various buildings. To his right, the main entrance and the information center. He tried to see inside the visitor's lobby. It looked crowded. At the main gate, he slowed behind a telephone company truck. The Pacific Bell repairman pulled out his ID. Sam became nervous knowing that he had no appointment, no ID, no connection to JPL now in any way. He wondered whether he would be able to talk to his way onto the grounds. His stomach began to flutter. He could feel his heart racing increasingly. He dried his palms on his jeans, then he sat up straight as the telephone truck moved away. The guard held his infamous brown clipboard. Sam knew that his name was not on the visitor or the vendor list. Those 5,400 engineers, scientists, and support personnel worked in an atmosphere of exploration and discovery where any day could bring about the revelation of secrets of the universe Remote satellites that duplicated the senses of man reached out beyond the fringes and beyond the edge of the solar system. Images flashed through Sam's mind. The rushing digitized photographs of the moon as a ranger crashed on the surface, shooting pictures before disintegrating. The rock-strewn desert vista of the Martian surface, and in the foreground, the frail, gleaming white body of the Viking lander. And, of course, the Voyager pictures taken on the grand tour of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, and the moons in the Saturnian orbit, and the burning ring of stars in the Milky Way taken by the infrared astronomical satellite. More images, the convoluted Uranian moon of Miranda, and the faint signals, barely four watts, transmitted from those robots millions of miles away to the Earth's surface. He remembered hearing those signals in the Great Hall of Mission Control and Spacecraft Tracking. The guard took one step from the gate and stared at Sam's van as he waved him forward. He looked at the front license plate of Sam's vehicle and scribbled the number on his clipboard list. Yes, sir, may I help you? Sam cleared his throat and tried to be as cool as possible. 
Uh, yes, I'm here to see Mr. Richard Redden. My name is Sam Alexander. Sam anticipated the next question. I have an appointment. The guard looked at him, then stepped inside the shack. He scanned the list of daily appointments for Sam's name and shook his head. No, I'm sorry, son, I don't see your name. What time was your appointment with the deputy director? Sam looked at a digital clock on his dashboard. Just about now, 10.30 a.m., the guard put the appointment list down and turned to Sam's vehicle. Behind him, cars, vans, trucks began to line up. The guard could see the impatience on drivers' faces. The almost completely gray-haired guard was getting grayer and more agitated. He grabbed a nearby wall phone. What's the extension up there? Sam smiled and shrugged. I'm sorry, sir, I really can't remember. He pretended to be looking for a note. I know I have it here written somewhere. The cars behind Sam were idling quickly. The guard hung up the phone with a hard slam. Okay, okay, the exasperated guard said. You just park in the section marked for guest. He then pointed it to the adjacent visitor center. March over to the check-in desk and have them ring up Mr. Redden. Sam was pulling away from the main gate even before the guard finished the sentence. He heaved a sigh of relief. At least he had gotten past the gate. Getting on to the premise and through that swinging Dutch door in the visitor center, that would be more difficult. Sam's nervousness transformed into excitement as he approached the double glass doors of the visitor center. He looked at his reflection in the glass for a split second before he opened the door. He was proud of his appearance in his coat and tie, carrying a leather briefcase. He looked older, looked as though he really did have an appointment with the deputy director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, if he could just get past the front desk to Richard Retton, he was sure he would be listened to. He took a deep breath and opened the door. The noise of a small milling crowd immediately increased Sam's excitement. He stood just inside the door and looked at the long reception desk in front of him. Behind the desk, a gallery of breathtaking photos from Voyager, Ranger, Surveyor, all lined the wall. He looked around the room. Some of the other visitors were government types, he figured, judging by their dress and briefcases they were carrying. At the far corner of the room, near the end of the reception desk, a clump of senior citizens chatted away, laughing and oogling at a huge photomontage of the Jupiter and Saturn moon systems. A large, not-too-friendly-looking young receptionist was involved in an intense conversation with the leader of the San Clemente Senior Citizens Recreational Club. Sam gripped his briefcase, took a deep breath, and moved slowly in behind the group leader. Sam listened closely as the frustrated receptionist tried to explain to the elderly gentleman why his tour would not begin for another hour. The time had been changed by the tour group, and the tour guide would not be available. Sam could hear the man grumbling about his tax dollars as he walked back to his group. The disappointed seniors groaned loudly as he tried to explain the snafu. Sam didn't notice the eyes of the receptionist riveted on him as she waited impatiently for him to move forward. He jumped when he heard her voice. Next, she said sharply. Sam was frozen for a moment, then he gained his composure and stepped forward. As he started to speak, his voice almost cracked. He forced air through it. Good morning, my name is Sam Alexander and I would like to see Mr. Richard Redden. The receptionist raised her eyebrows and shook her head slightly. She scanned Sam as he braced for the inevitable next question. Do you have an appointment? Sam hesitated. No. Young man, why are you here today? Isn't this a school day for you? Yes, it is, but I have to speak with Mr. Redden. It's very important. Are you a relative or friend? Uh, no, I... Does he know you and what this is about? No. The receptionist leaned even closer, her voice softened. Honey, why are you here? Sam gritted his teeth and moved back a step. He hated to be called honey. He didn't like it. He didn't like to be patronized. I'm here to see Richard Redden. Neither receptionist nor Sam noticed Richard Redden escorting two uniformed Navy officers 
to the glass entry doors at that moment. The receptionist sensed Sam's firmness and decided to respond in kind. Listen, sweetheart, you need an appointment to see the deputy director. Mr. Redden just cannot see people off the street. Richard heard his name as he turned away from the departing officers. He approached the information counter. He looked at the young man arguing with the receptionist and saw that their conversation was not friendly. The boy looked familiar to Richard. He then realized that the young man was a taller, older Sammy Alexander. He hadn't seen Peter's son in years, but the resemblance was unmistakable. He slowly approached Sam. I'm not just off the street, Sam said, his voice beginning to rise with his temper. Just tell him Sam Alexander is here. My father is Peter Alexander, who used to work here. I have some information on a SETI contact that Sam stopped in mid-sentence and stared at Richard Redden, a co-worker and not-so-close friend of his father. Richard's dull, auburn hair had darkened even more, and it was streaked with gray. The crow's feet, lines, creases on his face were deeper, and his cold black eyes were even blacker and colder. He was ancient, Sam thought. What was he now? Sam thought to himself and calculated. Fifty? Maybe fifty-five? Richard was, in fact, fifty-three. He had a tall, slim, skinny build and was starting to show a spare tire around his waist. His distant, distracted look was still there, and his smile was still hard to detect. As Sam remembered, he rarely smiled. He was always too intense for Sam and his father. Richard had a reputation for wanting to move on to something fast without considering the ramifications. At times, he was quick-tempered. He lived alone. He had no family. A mathematician by trade and training, Richard had moved away from a lifetime military career into a career in experimental mathematics where he could work alone, without supervision, without contact. The loner was now deputy director of JPL. His years of service with JPL cemented his administration position. His sometimes abrasive personality combined with a sharp, cunning mind was offensive to many people. But he was the organization's ramrod. Sam often wondered how Richard Redden ever became deputy director. That should have been his father's next move. That would have been his father's next move. Sam only hoped that if he ever got to JPL, Richard would be gone by then. To Sam, Richard was just okay. Something fake surrounded that man. But Sam considered the man just to be strange. Some genius types were like that, he thought. At that moment, it was the only contact at JPL Sam could approach with not-so-complete confidence. Tentative, uneasy confidence. The receptionist looked up and saw Richard. She immediately sat at attention. Mr. Redden, this young man... Richard smiled slightly. He held up his hand and placed his other hand on Sam's shoulder. Sam turned toward him, reassured by the warm hand on his shoulder, and smiled at Richard's face. He was glad to be rid of the receptionist. Mr. Redden, hi, I'm Sam. I know who you are. Richard held out his hand. Sam shook it with vigor. Richard continued, Sam... I knew your father quite well while he was here at JPL. In fact, we worked together once. Sam began to feel comfortable and at ease. I know. He told me about you and your work together on SETI, which is why I'm here. I want to talk to you about something. Richard looked at the receptionist. Marty, sign him in with me. She quickly handed Sam a stick-on visitor pass. Richard and Sam moved away from the confines of the stuffy visitor center, and directly into the quadrangle of JPL. To his left, Sam saw the towering dark blue administration building. He looked around at the beautifully landscaped park-like quad, the bridge, and the building beyond. On top of several buildings, he saw gleaming antennas and equipment. The sun was warm, the air was cool. Sam savored the moment. Richard and Sam walked slowly toward the administration building, Richard enjoyed the break from the administrative battles. He looked carefully at Sam and then became serious. Seeing Peter's boy after all those years had intrigued him. He noticed Sam's contentment. I guess this is the first time you've been back since you lost your folks. A comment 
abruptly changed Sam's mood. He stared up at Richard and squinted as the sun bore down on his face. He was almost offended by the curtness of Richard's approach. Yes, it's been quite a while, Sam said. Richard sensed what he had done and put a reassuring hand on Sam's shoulder again, but it didn't feel as reassuring as before. I knew your folks for a long time, Richard said, and although we weren't close, I was still shocked to hear about them. Sam looked down at the ground. Were you there at the memorial service? I don't think I saw you there. They approached the wide concrete stairway in front of the administration building, then walked up slowly. No, Sam, I'm afraid I couldn't make it. I was I was taking a tour of some facilities at Kwajalein in the Pacific, but you know my thoughts were with them and you. They continued up the staircase and into the lobby. A winding concrete and steel staircase was just to the right. Richard pointed to the staircase. Come on, let's walk up this way to my office. I need the exercise. I'm not young and healthy like you, he said, chuckling. Josephine had worked for Richard Retton for almost ten years, and she recognized the sound of his heavy, shuffling feet coming from the end of the hall. She also detected a smaller, more delicate step matched with Richard's. Richard turned the corner. Sam followed closely. The outer walls of the office where Josephine screened all visitors and calls was sparsely furnished, but fairly large. Her face lighted up as she saw Sam, and she paid even more attention to the young visitor than to Richard. She was not as animated around Richard as she could have been. She had no strong emotional attachment to Richard, and she liked to keep it that way. She was there for a job, and that was it. There was never any secretary boss lunches, only the obligatory dozen roses on Secretary's Day. Sam had determined long ago that the flowers Richard sent arrived only because of peer pressure of his fellow administrators. Richard almost swept past Josephine with Sam silently in tow. Sam smiled at Josephine as the heavy wooden door of, of Richard's office opened. Richard turned quickly. Josephine, this is Sam Alexander, he said. Sam stepped up to her and held out his hand. Nice to meet you, ma'am. Sam, very nice to meet you. Sam is Peter Alexander's son. Remember him? Josephine was in her mid-fifties, had been with JPL since 1969. She had known Sam's father, but never knew anything about his family or personal life. But upon hearing that Sam was Peter's son, she was flushed. Then a truly large smile crossed her face. She turned directly toward Sam and held out both hands. My goodness, Sam, then it is very nice to meet you. Thank you, Josephine, Sam replied. Richard stepped into his office. Sunlight from the large window overlooking the quadrangle flooded the outer office and Richard's office. Sam pulled away from Josephine. Josephine winked at Sam. I guess you better go. Maybe we can talk later. Okay, nice to meet you. Sam looked over his shoulder at Josephine. She was pleasant, and he liked her. He sensed her compassion. She was someone who evidently knew his father. It was a connection with the past, a sincere and heartfelt connection. Sam hesitated for a moment, but he had business to conduct. He stepped into Richard's office. As befitted the deputy director, Richard's office was large and well-appointed, a simple oak desk dominated the room. It was set in front of an oak credenza filled with plastic and wooden models of spacecraft and rocket launchers. The credenza sat under a large window overlooking the quad. On the left-hand return side of the desk, three 13-inch color monitors were encased in a single light green cabinet. In front of the monitors was an extensive keyboard. The monitors were turned off. Richard moved quickly to his position behind the desk, ready to hold court. He gestured for Sam to sit in front of him in one of the matching guest chairs. Sam looked around the room as he sat. Behind him, there was a three-piece seating area with a couch, a coffee table, and a side chair. Lining the room were huge, brilliant color pictures from the successful Voyager mission and deep space astrophotographs. On the wall next to Richard... Sam saw a row of black-and-white photographs. 
Richard was in every one, standing with politicians, scientific notables. A movie star or two was thrown in for flavor. Sam was intrigued by one photograph of Richard that obviously was taken at a cocktail party. Everyone was holding a glass of liquid refreshment. Richard was standing between Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, Sam's favorite science fiction authors. Then, of course, there were the diplomas, mostly from California schools. Richard did not have a doctorate, but citations and other important pieces of parchment indicating that his professional background was mathematics with some geology. For a second, he wondered how anyone could leave the exciting, ever-changing world of mathematics and the study of geology to become an administrator. Was it for the money or the title? So, Sammy, what can I do for you? Richard inquired. Sam's head swung around. He was caught off guard for a moment by being called a name he didn't like particularly. But Sam was a stranger. He squirmed in his chair. He cleared his throat. Uh, Mr. Redden, Richard held up his hand and cocked his head. Please, Sam, call me Richard, okay? Okay, well, Richard, I hope you won't think I'm nuts or anything, but I think I found a steady signal. Richard raised an eyebrow, smiled slightly, and leaned back in his chair. Sam continued, you see, I'm into ham radio and radio astronomy and I've converted some surplus dishes and microwave dishes and built some specialized receiving equipment, and I built an interface device for my computer system that's a combination spectrum analyzer and cipher modulator demodulator. I call it my secret black box. Actually, it's a black box with orange lettering, and I call it my mega channel extraterrestrial analyzer, or meta for short. Isn't there? Sam responded quickly. Yeah, I named it after Meta. That was put together at MIT by one of the professors there, I think. Anyway, I found a way to compress bandwidth and speed up signal search through a bunch of frequencies and also analyze and translate signals through various encryption and modulation possibilities. I built and burned some of the chips myself and used them in a series in parallel with a bunch of IC chips I ordered through the mail, he took a deep breath. Richard was hanging on to every word. He had the man's attention. Shall I go on? Please, please, Richard replied. Okay, here we go. The other night, last night, my equipment picked up an anomalous signal. The first time I picked it up, it was recorded on a computer disc. Last night, I was able to record it on tape. He reached into his briefcase and pulled out a small microcassette recorder. I transferred it to a microcassette so I could play it for you. Richard leaned forward and rested his elbows on his desk. Sam put the recorder on Richard's desk. You want to hear it? Sam asked. Richard shrugged. Sure, why not? Sam pushed the play button. The raspy white noise and warbling tone were audible although constricted by the miniature speaker of the recorder. Richard listened carefully. He turned his right ear toward the speaker. He shook his head, then leaned back. He finished listening. Sam caught the cue. He turned off the tape recorder. Sam, at what frequency did you record this at? And were you receiving an AM, an FM, or a single sideband? Or It really seems to be a form of radio teletype, simple radio teletype. I got the signal on the water hole, right on the hydrogen line, at 1420 megahertz, Sam said. Richard stared at Sam, and then smirked. You know, of course, that is almost too obvious. Sam reached into his briefcase and pulled out a manila folder. From the folder, he pulled out a sheet of computer form paper. Richard reluctantly reached for it, Sam said. And this is the plain text of the signal sent. It's simple and unbelievable, I know, but this is what I received last night. Richard read the sheet, then put it on top of a red plastic file folder on his desk. He studied Sam. There was a long silence between them. Sam was finished with what he had to say to Richard. Now he waited for Richard to pick up the conversation. He longed to hear the words, What a momentous discovery. This is what we've been waiting for. 
This is quite a coup. We'll do anything we can to help you. But life was not that simple. Richard asked, Sam, have you talked to anyone about this? What a strange question to ask, Sam thought. No, Sam answered. Sam thought of Ephraim and Mitch and Rollo. But of what importance are they to Richard Redden? Richard continued to consider what he had just heard. He swiveled towards desk return and reached for the main power switch of the three color monitors. He then grabbed a copy of the Los Angeles Times from the credenza behind him. Sam couldn't understand what was happening. There he was, telling the deputy director of JPL of what might be the greatest discovery in the history of mankind, and the man was turning on his televisions and reaching for a newspaper. Richard fumbled through the paper until he located the view section. Sam, I want to read you something, Richard said. Listen to this. Astronomers have announced the discovery of the most distant galaxy ever known. It says in the article that this group of astronomers at Johns Hopkins found a cluster of stars 15 billion light years away. He looked at Sam. That is long before the Earth was even formed. Richard looked down in his paper. It says, oh yeah, here, the newly discovered galaxy, 4C41.17, isn't that romantic, is far too faint to be seen by the eye but emits a radio signal a billion times more powerful than the sun's radio signal, making it the most powerful radio signal galaxy we know of. Sam shrugged. What's the point? I don't... Sam, this is great news for SETI hunters. Here we have a galaxy with a cluster of stars or suns, if you will, on the fringes of the known universe, a galaxy that has existed before even our own Earth, sun, our solar system, and even before our galaxy, the Milky Way. And it puts out a signal a billion times more powerful than the sun. Are, are, or should I say were, the planets surrounding those stars 15 billion light years away. Sam said, after he thought for a moment, but what's that got to do with me and my discovery? It's got to do with these guys who've discovered a monster using unbelievably sophisticated equipment. I know what Pete Billings is doing there in John Hopkins. Richard leaned back again. Time to give a lecture, he thought. Sam, we have a multi-million dollar 10-year program here at JPL and NASA, or at least a simple search for the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence. Your father was a pioneer in this field with Frank Drake and Project Ozma, then Project Cyclops. But a lot has changed since then. It is much larger and much more complicated, larger and more complicated than your single meta and your home computer and surplus microwave satellite dish. Sam's face sagged. He was being treated like a dumb kid who didn't know what he was doing or talking about. He sank down in his chair. We have two huge 200-meter dishes of Goldstone in Canberra in Australia online right now with a thousand-foot monster in Arecibo, the world's largest radio telescope, hooked up and involved in the ongoing search, Richard continued. We're using spectrum analyzers developed at Stanford that are able to discriminate among 10 million discrete channels instantaneously. Sam suddenly became wide-eyed. I've got that capacity, but I needed only the most important channel to locate the signal. Sam said. That slowed, but did not stop, Richard. We're looking at a range of frequencies between 1 and 10 gigahertz, and the whole shebang is being run by the Life Sciences Division of the Office of Space Science and Applications at NASA HQ in Washington. I mean, we have some pretty heavy dudes, as you might put it, Working on this, Sam, Richard paused dramatically. He turned to his monitors and punched in a few commands. On one monitor, he brought up a high-resolution picture of the rings of Saturn. On another, the boiling atmosphere features of Jupiter. And the third, a picture of a fractured surface of Miranda. Look at these images, Sam. They were taken by sturdy but fragile tiny spacecraft hurtling at tremendous speeds past the giant planets in the solar system. And from millions of miles away, 
They sent back detailed pictures and other telemetry that has changed our notion of how the universe might have been formed and of the forces that are currently at play on these planetary bodies. Richard's cadence and volume began to race and rise. The point is that JPL and NASA have the experience, equipment, and manpower to run the SETI search far beyond the means of any single amateur radio operator who has an interest in radio astronomy. Sam paused, then said, Mr. Redden, some of the biggest and most important discoveries of mankind were not made by large government organizations or private corporations. They were made by single individuals. Richard's mouth drooped a bit. He then realized that he was pushing Sam too hard and not getting through. So he smiled and became open and friendly again. You know, Sam, after that long blowhard speech I just gave, you just may be right. I know, Sam replied quickly. This signal of yours may be terrestrial in origin, or it may be a satellite passing overhead where your dish was pointed, or it may be a bit of unfamiliar space-generated natural source noise we haven't figured out yet. Or, or, you may have picked up a signal from an alien civilization located in deep space. I just don't know. I really don't. So, what do you want from me? Richard asked. I mean, I, how can I help you? Why have you come to me, and what can I do for you? I mean, more than just an honest and sincere opinion. Sam shook his head. He didn't know what to tell him. Why was this guy talking so much? I'm sure, Sam said quietly, that around here you must have ways of verifying my discovery. Maybe you could check the authenticity of this signal. We could work together, or you could help me present this to the press or some official scientific organization with your backing. If you were with me on this, they'd listen to the both of us together more than they would listen to me alone. Then we can move on and try to figure out where this signal was coming from. Who is sending it? What are they really saying? And what information on earth should we send back to them? Richard paused, thought for the longest time, Sam thought. That sounds reasonable, Sam, of course. The time and distance differences would make two-way conversation impossible, do you have the original of that tape with you? Sam paused and considered his options. Slowly and reluctantly, he pulled out a full-size cassette tape. It was a copy. The original was safe in Sam's room at home. I need both tapes, your micro and the original cassette, so we can analyze the signal. Don't worry, they'll be safe with me. Sam handed the tapes over to Richard. I'll take this over to a few people, Richard said as he handed Sam a business card. Give me your telephone number, and I'll get back to you in a short while. Sam wrote his telephone number on a piece of notepaper as Richard chatted amiably about the SETI search and Sam's potential discovery. Then Richard escorted him past a very pleasant Josephine who said, Come visit again soon. Sam walked away from Richard's office alone. Richard stepped toward a large window and leaned against it. He watched Sam emerge from the lobby and walk away toward the visitor center. Richard glanced at Sam's tapes and the printed text, which was still sitting on top of his red file, his hot file, a file containing the data shipped to JPL from Goldstone, data that matched, though not in signal strength and amplitude, the tape he had just received from Sam. Richard thought about the meta black box Sam had and about how he could get his hands on it, legally or illegally. The parking lot was still packed. Sam temporarily forgot where he had parked. That occupied his mind until he saw the antenna protruding from his Jeep Cherokee at the far end of the lot. He cursed at the long walk. He considered his conversation with Richard and Richard's reaction. Had he done the right thing, going to Richard and giving him the tape? Sam shook off his uneasiness. He was too excited by his discovery.